Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the module two videos. So today we're gonna be continuing the kind of second half of uh, chapter one, I guess loosely second half. It's part two of the video lecture series, if you will. Um, we're gonna continue talking about a little bit more on the anatomy side of things. Today we're gonna talk skeletal system, bony structures, as well as joints, and then kind of get into movement terms rather than sit here and just me go through the movement terms as there's pictures and terms on slides. I'm gonna leave those on D2L for you to go through. Most of them have pictures, that way you can kind of see what the, what the movement is. I highly recommend that when you're going through all this, you actually act out the movement. As weird as that sounds, it kind of helps put two and two together. And then whenever you go and are studying for this type of thing, um, or using those, using those crossword puzzles, that type of stuff, Try to think about what the movement is, what the action is, and, and kind of take your body through, like, you know, through that action, and it should help you remember some of them. So getting into skeletal system, um, I, I got to say, I've heard people refer to skeletal as skeletal, and it's probably the most annoying thing that I've ever heard in my entire life to hear someone go, oh, in the skeletal system. Um, so skeletal system, largely divided into two different divisions. You're going to have the appendicular skeleton system, and then you're going to have the axial skeleton system. Appendicular and axial should tell you approximately what they are right? Our appendages are going to be the things that are not in our kind of thorax and in our head. So essentially the appendicular is everything that is the appendages, right? Limbs, so arms and legs, as well as the hands and the feet, and then the shoulder as well. So all together, there's about 126 bones. There's some really small bones inside of the hands and inside of the feet. We got some really big bones, um, in the, like the femur and the tibia and the fibula and stuff like that. Um, axial skeleton is going to be comprised of the skull, vertebral column, vertebral column, vertebral column, however you want to say it, the ribs, the sternum, and the pelvis. Okay, so the pelvis is one that kind of gets tossed back and forth. You'll see some references put the pelvis in side of the appendicular skeleton. Some individuals will put the, the pelvis in the axial skeleton. So it kind of depends which way you want to go with it. Arguments can be made for both ones. So don't feel that it's, it's exactly set in stone. If you look, you'll notice that those two different divisions add up to approximately 206 bones, um, which is the approximate number. Um, uh, you, they're always coming up with new crazy things all the time. So who knows, we could discover 30 million more bones, I mean, hyperbole, but whatever. So what, what is it that the bones even do, right? Uh, think, think about this logically as you're going through it. Why do we have bones? Well, first off, we got a lot of stuff inside of us that we need to protect. So if you think, what is some of the most important organs in our body that we literally cannot live without? You get your brain inside of a bone. You got your heart inside of bones. You got your lungs inside of bones, right? So the, the bones are going to be serving to protect some of our soft tissue. There's a lot of very important things that are encased or surrounded by bones to try to prevent trauma too. Another thing is they're going to be used to support and maintain our posture. If we did not have bones, we'd essentially just be like a puddle. Um, I mean, we'd be like a, I don't know, flubber or something like that, right? Like we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have much structure to us. Um, they serve as movements and lever arms. So if you think about your arms, right, you essentially have lever arms that are occurring. So you actually have attachment sites for muscles. I don't know if you can even see that on the screen. That's the worst part about online teaching. Um, those, the way that your muscle attaches to bones will actually serve to provide some of the, actually most, if not all of the mechanical action that's occurring. So it will actually provide movement via bones. Um, it's, it serves as a spot of mineral storage. So we actually use them like deep freezers, right? Like it's, it's a place that we're keeping large amounts of calcium and large amounts of phosphorus. I had a student um, in my kinese class, or not my kinese, sorry, my ex-phys class asked me where's phosphorus come from? Like where are we getting all this phosphorus from? For, for stuff like ATP and whatnot. Um, I was like, well, you know, your bones are one source of phosphorus inside the body. Uh, it's a pretty big source of it too. Um, 
Another thing is hematopoiesis. So we'll get into this a little bit more, but inside of certain types of bones, you're going to have bone marrow. And that bone marrow is going to be the primary sites for the creation of blood cells and red blood cells specifically. So you're going to have that inside of stuff like the femur and the humerus, um, small amounts inside of the ribs and sternum as well. So they're very, very important things inside of our body. So it, they require quite a bit of study and they require quite a bit of respect. When it comes to the types of bones, uh, you can read through them here. I've got slides for each separate type of bone um, in general. So this is going to be what type of bone, long bone, why? Because it's, you guessed it, it's long um, and more because it has a fairly regular shape as well. You're going to have short bones. Um, here you go right here is an example of short bones. We'll get into many more of them. Flat bones, great example is the skull right? Parts of the skull are quite flat. Um, sesamoid bones, so that's actually a kneecap right there. And then irregular bones, literally named irregular because they are irregularly shaped, right? Like I said at the very beginning of this class, a lot of anatomy and a lot of the kind of structures fit their function or their shape or kind of um, their nomenclature makes rational sense. It's logical in its progression. It's logical in its development. So what are long bones? Well, they are a long cylindrical shaft with wide and protruding ends. Remember I said that bones can act as levers? Well, these are predominantly going to be your, your movement-based bones, your, your big, large movement-based bones. Uh, shaft has a medullary cavity, right? So that's where a lot of this um, hematopoiesis and things like that can be occurring. Just because they're called a long bone, I don't want you to think that they have to be massive. I don't want you to think that it has to be the size of your femur for it to be a long bone, because then we would only have a femur that's a long bone. Uh, phalanges, metatarsals, metacarpals, so the hands inside, some of the hand, like bones inside of your hands and your feet technically are long bones because of their structure. Uh, tibia and fibula, femur, right? The, the big bone that runs through the top of your thigh, bit, like literally from your hip to your knee, it's your femur. Um, your radius and your ulna, right? Radius and your ulna. Those are all going to be long bones because of their shape. And it makes sense when you think, what is this? It's a long cylindrical with these kind of rounded ends. I mean, short bones, remember, name follows function. Um, name follows... I gotta go. I got a ghost mic. Um, the name or is kind of nomenclature follows what it looks like, its shape, its function. However, so short bones are literally small, cube-shaped, soft bone or solid bones that have large articular surfaces. So they allow movement across them, um, so that they can actually move alongside other bones. So their structure is set up so that they can shift and move alongside other bones. So they're think of it like. Um, flagstone or think of it like pavers right so they're they're there for shock absorption they're there for providing structure they're there for all these different things but because of how many surfaces they have because of their shape they're able to articulate and kind of form to fit this surface if you will so here's some examples of some short bones these are going to be in here right and if you remember your metatarsals and phalanges technically are counting as long bones. If you don't believe me, sorry, but I'm right. Cool. Flat bones. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, you'll never guess it. They might have some flatness to them. Great examples, ilium. Um, so if you think about the shape of the ilium, it's going to be flat. Um, you're going to have the ribs as well are going to be fairly flat. If anyone's ever held a rib inside their hands, whether it's, um, from pork or from beef or from human or from a deer or whatever, like they actually are, they're, they're curved, but they, they have flat sides to them. Uh, sternum is also in same with the cranial bones, um, which you can kind of see here in the background. I tried to make, not make the image so painfully obvious, uh, or not obvious, but painfully um, overt for you. Irregular bones, again, they're regularly 
they're named irregular because they're irregularly shaped. Think about it. You've got the sacrum, like that is a goofy looking thing. Um, kind of looks like something out of the movie Alien. You've got the bones of the spine. If you think about uh, all the spinous processes and things off of the off of the spine, they're really kind of goofy looking bones. And then you have your maxilla as well, right? So you have your lower jawbone doesn't really fit any other um, any other bone type. And so here's a great example of some of the irregular bones for you. Sesamoid bones, um, small bones that can lie within a tendon of a musculotendinous unit, so the combination of muscle and tendon, provide a couple different things. A big thing, one of the best examples of one of these types of bones is going to be the patella. And we, I have a really good picture to show you this, but essentially what it's doing is it's, it's enhancing the mechanical advantage of the joint. By having that bone structure there, you're actually going to increase the mechanical advantage. So you're going to increase... Um, kind of the functionality, if you will, or, or the, the betterment of the joint by having that bone there. Uh, there's also other uh, sesamoid bones there in the flexor tendons of the big toe and in the thumbs. These can vary between individuals. So they can vary between individuals, so inter-individual, but then they can also vary intra-individual, so they can be present and not present in contralateral sides of individuals. So here we go. This is how a patella or how a sesamoid bone might actually, or it does actually improve the mechanical advantage of, of the knee joint especially. So if you look, you kind of have the quadricep and quad tendon that runs across the top of the patella, right? If we take and we move and we change the plane with which we are seeing this, which what plane would we be seeing this in? Would we be seeing this in a frontal view or in a sagittal view or in a coronal view? Um, if you change the plane with which we're seeing this, you can see that we have a patella in A and we do not have a patella in B. And if you look at the, the moment arm here, in the axis of rotation and the angle of pull, you can actually see that we improve all of that by having this patella here. We're lengthening that moment arm. So we're actually improving and increasing uh, essentially the, the ability to generate force or torque through this range here. All right, so as we're rotating the tibia and fibula around, it's actually in a stronger position, or, or the joint is stronger, the movement is stronger because of the patella, because we're actually increasing the distance of that moment arm. I don't know if you will believe me completely or not, but this arrow is the same as this arrow. Copy and pasted it. And you can see that that moment arm is dramatically contracted. So here it literally goes from the axis of rotation all the way out to the edge of the patellar ligament. Uh, patellar tendon and and you can see here or quad tendon patellar ligament sorry you can see here that 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 moment arm is dramatically shortened i mean i can't even fit this whole arrow inside of it so that would reduce the mechanical advantage so that's that's a really interesting example of how sesamoid bones can improve function and it's a really good example of why patellas are super important um side note something that's kind of cool about patellas that um I truthfully didn't really appreciate until recently is that some people have one patella, some people have multiple bones that form their patella. It's kind of a neat thing, kind of random, but it's kind of a neat thing. What are some of the features of bones? Why, why would we care about identifying features of bones? Well, one, it's kind of like last class, right? Like it helps us use common terminology. It helps us identify common sites so that we can have conversations across people with reference to the exact same spot. So when it comes to long bones, you're going to have the shaft. And that is especially obvious on a long bone, right? Because it's the long, um, like cylindrical piece then we're going to get into a couple of things that are a little bit different, right? So you're going to have a cortex, the wall of the diaphysis, um, and it's going to be kind of this hard, compact, bony area. On the outer side of that, you're going to have the periosteum. So that's kind of the outer surface. You're going to have the endosteum, which is a, 
a membrane that is like the inside of the cortex. I've got pictures, I promise. I'm just going through the text first so that we can go back and forth and, and it'll make sense. You have the medullary, which is going to be the marrow cavity. Remember, the site of hematopoiesis is going to be in the marrow. So this is the location in which the marrow is going to lie or be found. And that's inside of the diaphysis or inside of the shaft. The epiphysis is on the ends of a long bone. So it's the, it's the enlarged sections. If you think about the, if you think about the femur, it's like the ball of the ball and socket. And if you think about down at the knee, it's part, it's like the upper part of the hinge. So there's going to be epiphysis. You're going to have cancellous bone, which is kind of like spongy tissue inside parts of the bone. I don't know what I was just doing with my hands. <laughs> I think I was jumping on a sponge. Uh, you're going to have the epiphyseal plate. So think growth plate. Um, it's a thin layer of cartilage that is kind of, it's towards the ends. It's towards the more proximal and towards the more distal end of the long bones. And it's right at where like the diaphysis and the epiphysis are at growth. And I've got a really cool radiograph or an x-ray. Um, that will show you exactly what that looks like on x-ray. And it's, it's the growth plate, right? Like you've, you've heard people say, oh, well, his growth plates aren't fully, for, or fully closed or blah, blah, blah. He's still got this much that he's going to grow. It, that's what they're talking about. In, around the, the sites of articulation, so the epiphyses, um, you're going to have this cartilage, cartilaginous like covering. Um, it's going to, it provides cushioning, but it, it helps to kind of allow the allow the joint to slide and move a little bit cleaner. And there's actually some pathologies. So this is where stuff like osteoarthritis comes into play. So you, like you can have loss of that cartilage. Um, and in, in the next video, we'll talk a little bit more about mm. some of that. We won't get into it too much, but it, there's at least more mention of it, I promise. I promised you that we would have this. Um, figure again and all I did was highlight it right so you've got the shaft um, right here you've got the diaphysis which is the outer layer um, you have let's see you have the epiphyseal line so you've got the growth plate here you can kind of see this is the trabeculae if you remember anatomy and physiology you've got the articular the hyaline cartilage here and here um, you have the periosteum which is along the outside you've got your medullary cavity that lies within the uh, inside, and that's where your bone marrow is going to be. Um, I can't remember what I missed and what I didn't hit. So, But all these are, are the terms that were on the previous slide for you. Here's a really cool radiograph, and, and truthfully, it's one of, I, I'd say it's one of the cleaner ones that I've, that I pulled off of Google. Um, there were some really goofy ones that I was trying to pull to make it a, a little bit more challenging for you, but I wanted to keep it plainly obvious. So you can see that it's it's literally the section between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. Um, and so this section will actually, as an individual ages out of adole adolescence, it will begin to close um, and, and will actually completely close when they're done growing. So histology is a way that we can stain tissue. And it doesn't just have to be bone tissue. It can be any type of tissue. But what we're, what we're looking at here is something called H and E staining. Uh, it's hematoxylin and eosin. You don't need to know that. But what you're what you're essentially doing is you're staining everything that would show up blue would be nuclei, and everything that is showing up pink is actually cytoplasm. Um, so you're seeing cells. You're seeing structures. You're seeing the inside of these these structures by seeing pink. If that makes sense. So if you're looking at this top top one, what you're looking at is this cancellous bone, this spongy bone, this this trabeculae. And what you're seeing here is this is actually bone, right? Like this is bony structure. This is bone cells. And then here, you've got all of the marrow, right? You've got marrow and adipose tissue. So adipose tissue is not, it's, it's a lipid droplet and it is fat. It's predominantly fat with very little cytoplasm. So that's why it's showing up as white here. And, and you can see why it's kind of called spongy because you can see how it would have a compressible aspect to it because the cells aren't right on top of each other. And there's actually a gap between them. Same exact thing here with the H&E staining, but what we're looking at 
is we're looking at a compact bone. So we're looking at cortical bone. We're looking at the, the hard bone that you would normally expect or what, what you normally think of when you're thinking of a bone is what we're looking at on the bottom. And you can tell it's a lot more compact. It's a lot more rigid. It's a lot, more, it's a lot stronger and less likely to, um, to compress. So when it comes to bone development and bone growth, there is a very, um, very reliable bone development and growth pattern. Um, our, as you guys probably know from, from anatomy and physiology, we actually end up having this, a, a bone growth from cartilaginous tissue like our our bones develop from hyaline cartilage inside of the body uh inside of the womb and they they become more and more solid bone and more and, and more rigid bone as we age um and then once we hit a certain age they're the bones are kind of done growing in a longitudinal manner so they're they're done with their with their length growth if you will which sounded really funny but it's it's when the epiphyseal plates close and it's actually when the bone is is fully formed quote unquote right like for a lot of people it's by the time they're 18 i think mine closed uh right around then i broke a lot of bones when i was growing up because of playing sports and doing dumb stuff um and i remember a couple of x-rays where they were like oh your growth plates aren't completely closed uh it was i fractured a tibia when i was when i tore an acl um, so it was around, around 18 or 19 that mine were almost completely closed. Random side note that none of you probably care about. However, it humanizes me. The, uh, the other, the other way that our bones grow and they continue to grow throughout our life is width wise. So our bones will only grow to a certain length. However, they can grow width wise throughout the duration of life. They can also go the opposite way. They can continue to shrink. And that would be like osteoporosis, osteo, um, it would be like osteoporosis, osteopenia, man, I could not think of that word to save my life. Um, it, osteoporosis, osteopenia, it's kind of like a, a bone, a loss in bone mineral density, a loss in bone width and bone size and bone diameter, right? Osteoclasts are a very specific type of cell that break down uh, the bone cells, they, they break down bone and liberate some of that calcium and stuff. And then you have osteoblasts, which help to form new bone. One of the best ways to remember this is C stands for catabolize. C, catabolize, catabolize means to break something down. Um, so osteoclasts are breaking it down. So osteoblasts, B stands for building. Osteoblasts are building new bone. Hopefully that helps you somewhat. So this is kind of a diagram. I don't, I don't think you guys need to know this. I, I will not test you on this. This is um, kind of the growth pattern that our bones go through from the time that we're infants and all the way through toddlers and eventually to um, a fully formed bone. This is an example of how bone formation occurs in the width manner. So you can see that you actually have or not innervation, but you have um, blood flow that comes in via the artery. And then slowly those osteoblasts start to close in around that blood flow. So you have this bony ridge, this periosteal ridge that will eventually close in via osteoblast activities and create kind of like this tunnel hence here. And then that kind of continues to occur in several different uh, areas. So that's how you continue to add width on. So like this would be adding width on. So it's further out. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So it's kind of like it rings out in terms of growth. So when it comes to bone adaptation, you need to understand what the bones are kind of made out of in order to understand how they handle stress, to understand how they respond to stress and how they adapt. So really, uh, bones are comprised of two different types of calcium, calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate. That's where your phosphorus group is. That's where phosphorus is found in the body and in, in large mineral deposits. Uh, there's also collagen, which is important to know. And then there's water as well, right? Because I feel like there's water in every compartment of the body just about. 
um, 67% of our body weight is actually, or 60, 70% of the bone weight is actually due to calcium, both in carbonate and phosphate forms. So it's that mineral density is really, is really related to calcium. That's why everyone always says, drink your milk and stuff like that. It's very loose, um, because you also need vitamin, vitamin D from stuff like the sun, but it's, it's still out there. Um, water contributes largely the rest of the, of the body weight or of the, of the bone weight. Sorry. The B O weight is getting me. And then that collagen, right? So if we're getting, think about this, we're getting mass, we're getting mass and we're getting mass. What is that collagen in there for? If it's not really a mass agent, um, it's really there for flexion and like flexibility and tension resistance. So it gives our bones the ability to deal with stressors and it gives our bones the ability to deal with kind of like a bending and a compressing force, if that makes sense. So as we age, we actually start to get like a brittleness as we drop our, our activity level, we start to get a bone brittleness and some of that could be due to, uh, the, the changes in the minerals and the changes in the bone properties, such as the collagen content and the, the calcium contents as well. So when it comes to adaptation to different types of stress, so think of strain and stress as different. So this is kind of like the, um, the strain is the change in length divided by the original length. So it's strain is the compression, if you will, it's the sponginess, hint, hint, and then the stress is how much, uh, how much kind of force it can withstand. So how much of a load can it withstand? So cortical bone is very, very strong, very, very dense, and it's going to be able to withstand high levels of stress. So it's going to be able to stand high levels of force to it, right? The cortical bone is going to be what's predominantly giving us our rigid structure and our, and our posture and stuff like that. Then our trabecular bone or our cancellous bone, the one that's made up of trabecula, um, is, is going to be contributing to the strain in the way that our body and the way that our bones can handle strain or compressive force. So you can see that when it comes to stress, our, our cortical bone is really able to handle high loads of stress. But then when you look at the trabecular bone, we're not able to, it's not able to handle high levels of stress, but it's able to handle high levels of strain. And then here you can see that the, the cortical bone is not really able to handle any compression. So we get both strength against stress and strength against compression from these two different types of bones. And it makes sense if you think about where these are located. If we were to put the, the piece of bone that could handle high levels of strain and high levels of sponginess inside of the middle of the bone in that diaphysis, diaphys diaphysis, you could compress that and change its length a lot, right? But if you put it in the ends, then it can withstand force quite a bit, but it can also withstand impact and changes in impact, um, which is pretty important for athletics and for just human growth and development, right? Um, when it comes to bone restructuring and bone shapes. So it, it largely depends on the forces that are going to be applied to, to the bone. And, and that makes sense, right? Like if we don't stress our body, our body doesn't respond and our body doesn't adapt. It's the same thing going on here with our bone. We actually have to stress our bones in several different uh, vectors in order to get optimal bone growth. So essentially what you get is uh, Wolf's Law, which is, and, uh, and I beg your pardon for having to read this to you, but bone and healthy individual will adapt to loads under which it is placed. When a particular bone is subjected to increased loading, the bone will remodel itself over time to become stronger. To resist that particular type of loading, it adapts. As a result, the external cortical portion of the bone becomes thicker. It grows. The opposite is also true. So it becomes stronger and it becomes, it gains an ability to handle higher levels of stress. Um, 
this is kind of why I like the concept of lift big, get big. It applies to bone, not just gains, right? And that's exactly what you see going on here, um, kind of. <laughs> so it's what you got going on over here with Kickboxer. Uh, this is actually a very good movie, Kickboxer. Um, but it's how he's able to essentially strengthen his shins and his shank so that he can handle kicking palm trees. If you ever watch Muay Thai fighters, certain Muay Thai fighters, they can like kick down banana trees by their shin um, because their bone is so strong that it doesn't break, which is kind of cool. Um, and then it's also a reason why it's very important for older people to continue to go through different types of resistance training activities. And one of the best is deadlifts and squats because you actually get vertical loading of the femurs and of the pelvis. So you can actually um, get different types of stress applied through those bones and get better um, bony adaptations, if you will. This is something that is completely unrelated, but I think it's super cool. Um, over on the right-hand side, we'll still talk about the left, but let's talk about the cool stuff first. Um, on the right, on the furthest right, this section right here, uh, I think this guy's name is Otis. So he's like the the frozen ice man. So he's this ancient human, um, and they ended up finding like 61 tattoos on this guy, which I, I is really cool because that means that tattoo history and tattoo culture is that old. Um, but then there's also, uh, not nearly as old as this guy, I think his name is Otis, um, not nearly as old as this, is there is cultures in um, different parts of Africa that they were actually tattooing femurs and tattooing bones. Um, don't know if it was on like live people or not. It's not the way the tattoos work is by staining bone. It's staying, it kind of, it, it's a skin thing, of course, but it's still really interesting that it's they were using tattoos in that way. Um, so bone markings, there's different types of, uh, I don't like the term markings. There are different types of, um, different types of formations on bones and they can be processes which form joints or help to serve as sites of attachment for muscles, tendons, ligaments, that type of stuff, right? Um, but then there's also cavities, and those can be grooves to help control the point of rotation or movement or manipulation of a joint. So processes are kind of like outcroppings, cavities are um, the opposite. <laughs> okay, next slide, we'll get into more joints and different types of joints and that type of stuff. And then the third slideshow that I put up for you guys is different types of movement actions, which I will not be going through via video just to help save you guys some time. 